first time I spoke in public, I think I was 27. And um, during that time, I wanted to be able to have this conference. And I went to this conference and I was just so nervous I couldn't speak. And when I got there, I had to ask one of this grandmother, come with me, hold my hand, pray for me, I'm so scared, I don't want to talk. And it was, it was, it's a sad story, but it's also a good story because at that time, um, when they called me, they said, um, the people are going crazy because there's a young medicine woman here. That's sad. Because like, I'm considered a traditional seer. I was born and I could see and hear spirits, but one of the things the grandfathers told me is they said that every woman gives birth to a seer. So there's how many children like that, small children that could see and hear spirits. The only difference between me and those children is that I was taught, I was trained to do what I'm doing today since I was a little girl from uh, my grandparents teaching me about the creation stories and uh, talking to me about natural law when I was a little girl. Uh, my parents didn't really know what to do with me when I was a small child. <clears throat> so they didn't know what to do with me when I was a small child. And um, I think I kind of freaked out my life. <laughs> I would, uh, as a little girl, I used to see spirits and I didn't know. Ooh, that's kind of too loud. Hey. <laughs> I didn't understand or realize that not all people could see and hear spirits. I only figured it out because I used to play with my cousins. And then I would see spirits and they would talk to me. And um, when I would see these spirits and they were talking to me, I was, I was thinking, how come my cousins can't hear them? So I started to ask them. I would say, hey, can you see that guy there? And they would say, no. And I would see little people, and I would be talking to them. And I would ask my cousins again, hey, can you see that small person? They would say, no. And I kind of thought I was crazy, eh? And I went walking home. I was real sad. And I went to my mom, and I said, mom, and I was just a little girl. And she said, what? I said, I'm really sad. And she said, how come? Because I think I'm crazy, mom. <laughs> <laughs> she said, why? I said, because how come I see all these things? And I see people, and I'm talking to them. And I can see those small people, and I'm talking to them. But how come my cousins can't see them, Mom? And I was really sad. I really, at that time when I was a little kid, I thought there was something wrong with me. And, <clears throat> and then my mom, she stopped and she said, um, we should have told you a long time ago. She said, you were born a seer. You were born like that. And she said, people came to look for you when you were a baby, these elders. And they told us how to take care of you and how to teach you. So I felt a little better at that. And uh, my parents were told that I needed a spiritual, religious education. And um, so they took me to all kinds of ceremonies, sweats, night lodge, all kinds of different ceremonies all over. And I would ask my dad, Dad, how come we're here? And he would say, you're here to listen. You're here to learn. And he also took me to the churches. He wasn't, he didn't believe in uh, the churches, but because he was told what to do with me, he listened and he did that. So he ended up, we would go to the different churches in our area once a year to every church and he would say, listen, watch. So that's what I did. I spent my childhood listening. I spent my childhood watching people. I spent my childhood studying people. And it was a really beautiful uh, childhood. But it was also a difficult childhood. You know, it took me a long time to, um, I guess, to accept that because it was, it was sad sometimes because my brothers and my sisters and my cousins would be playing, but I wasn't playing. I was sitting in a room with a bunch of old people. And that was hard because I didn't have a childhood like other people. I didn't, so that's the truth. So it took a lot of sacrifice, even sacrifice as a small little girl to learn the things that I learned, but I'm really grateful for it today. And 
it helped me a lot to understand this world and understand what I was seeing, understanding the problems that I was witnessing in our communities, with our people, with our, our young children. And I prayed a lot. I remember <clears throat> my Gokam, I had all of these dreams as a little girl. And they were um, like how Munyawa called prophecy dreams. I dreamt about all these things that were going to happen in the future. And so far, half of the things that I've seen since I was a little girl, they already happened. So I, I'm like halfway, they showed me up until this point, the things that were going to happen. And I didn't understand them. When I was a little girl, I remember I used to tell my Gukum and Musham, my parents kind of had a hard time. They didn't know what to do with me. So um, my, they went and gave me to my Gukum and Musham. And I stayed with my grandparents till I went to school. So I had a traditional education before I had a Munyao education. And they started with the creation stories. I think I started, uh, the earliest I can remember was probably about two years old. That's when they started telling me the creation stories. And uh, it was one of the most beautiful times. I remember uh, I used to get really, really happy and really excited when the snow would come. I remember what one, one uh, winter, my musha woke me up, no Sam, Anska, come, I stopped. And I came running out of the bedroom and he said, look. And I looked out the window and there was snow and I just started jumping up and down. I was so happy because this was the time of our stories. There were certain stories that you tell and you have to wait for the snow. And I was real happy. I was so excited because it was snowing. And because this was my favorite time of year because during the nights, um, my grandparents, they had a very small <coughs> little humble house. Eh? They didn't have anything fancy. They didn't even own a vehicle. Um, but I never thought they were poor. My mushroom had a bedroom on one side of the house and on the other side, me and my gukum. And it was, it was, uh, you know, I never really thought too much about it, but I remember, you know, my Musham, he never even ever came in my, me and my Gukum's room. He used to put a chair outside the door of the room. And then at night, he would sit outside by the door and he would tell stories. He would tell me about the creation stories. He would talk about natural law. And I remember, <clears throat> I remember listening to them. And some of those stories, like, you know, I'm sure there's lots of you that have heard the creation stories, some of them are real, real scary. Like, you don't want to hear them that. Well, I'll tell you today if you want that. <laughs> but they're scary, eh? I remember uh, uh, they would talk about which story to tell today. And uh, Gukum would say, well, what story are you going to tell her today? And then he would say, uh, uh, he would talk about um, these stories. And then my Gukum would say, no, not that one. In Cree, though, eh? Because he'll scare her. And he would say, no, no, she has to know the truth. Doesn't matter if she gets scared. So I've heard some of the really scary stories. And I started to think about it. You know, I travel to a lot of schools for a storytelling week. Throughout the winter, I'm traveling um, to different communities to go do storytelling in the schools. And a lot of the schools, they don't want me to tell those scary stories. They don't want that. But you know what? Because of those stories, they taught me a lot of discipline. They taught me a lot of what you don't do. So I think in this time, we need to think about that because a lot of people are really omitting the really scary stories from our creation stories. And those things need to be heard because when you listen to them and when you speak about them, it teaches you to be careful with your life. It teaches you to be careful of how you walk, how you speak. And that's one of the things, you know, my mom always told, you know, she, she talked to me. I've been traveling many years and one day she sat me down, she said, guys, she said, I'm gonna tell you something. She said, be careful that you don't offend the people. Be careful, watch how you speak. Be careful with your words because you can offend somebody. She said, what your job is. She said, these people all over, they have their own fire. Their fire is lit, otherwise they wouldn't be alive. Their fire is strong. 
And she said, what you're doing when you travel all over, you're bringing wood. You're going to give them a piece of wood. You're going to say, here, this is for your fire. She said, that's what you're doing. You're not lighting their fires because their fire is already lit. That's why they're alive. That's why they survived all this time. So I said, okay, mom. I said, thank you. I'll listen to you. And, <clears throat> you know, it was very important, you know, growing up. I remember my Gukum really um, made me practice a lot of things before we went somewhere. Like, let's say we're going to go to a feast and, uh, or somewhere. And I, I was just like, um, well, this day, I was just like a little doll to all the old people, eh? Because I was real small and I was with my book and my mush I'm wearing mucklucks, moxes. I didn't even have runners when I was a little girl. And I dressed like a little kukum. My kukum made me dresses like her. So all these old people thought I was so cute and they would all carry me and they would all, you know, hug me everywhere I went. And my kukum used to say, all right, sit down. We're going to practice. Somebody's going to come up to you and they're going to say, Dante Otsigia. And, uh, and I'd say, okay, Gokum, this is what you say. And then she'd tell me a real long story. She said, Dante Otsi Kia, where is your belly button from? Where is your blood? And so she made me practice, okay. So on your mom's side, my mom is uh, Jean Puyak, her maiden name is Armstrong. Her dad, William Spyglass, they're, she's Nakoda. Her dad is Nakoda, 100% Nakoda. On her mom, Helen Bird. Helen Bird is Nakoda. She, my mom is actually no mix. They're just pure Nakoda. And she said, and your grandparents. And she would tell me the names. And then she said, now on your dad's side. Then you say, my gukum is Emily Mayo. My musham, Solomon Puya. Then you speak about their grandparents because you're talking about the blood. She said, you know, like Moyan, you know, not like people are. Some people are saying um, they're from here, a res name of a reserve. And I tried to listen to her, then I got to be a teenager. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> we went to this gathering and I had my friends there. And I didn't know my gukum was standing behind me, eh? And somebody comes up to me, Tante Otsigya. I said, I'm from Sweetgrass. Holy, I didn't even know she was real stealthy, eh? She was right behind me, hey, I step. And she just pulled me real hard. We're not even related to that guy, Chief Sweetgrass. Why are you saying that? <laughs> <laughs> you can't even say that because we're not even blood relatives to him. What did I tell you what that means, Dante Otsigia? And I said, okay, Gokum. I was just trying to be like everybody else. But she scolded me if I said that. And she said, you cannot say that because we're not a blood relative of Chief Sweetgrass. You can't say that. So I had a lot of uh, strict, difficult lessons from her. And I was really uh, uh, thankful for her though. I remember the very first time from some of those dreams I had, I had this dream about, <clears throat> I was seven years old. And when I used to have dreams, I would wake up in the morning and I'd say, Gukum, Musham, I had a dream. And they'd say, oh, just go, just go. And they would say, come here, come and sit at the table. And then they would light up the sweet grass. And they would both pray. And then I would say, okay, no, so what did you see in your dream? And then they would, they, I would tell them what I dreamt about. And if they didn't know how to translate that dream, what they would do is they would take me to an elder or they would bring another elder to come and see me. And, my, and I would ask her, Gukum, how do you know which one to get? And she said, because we pray, we keep praying, and then the, the right one will come. And then they would go get them, or we'll go see them, somehow. <coughs> but on this dream, um, she told me, and my mission told me, they said, this is a sacred dream, and you have to fast now. And I said, but what is it, Luca? She said, you can't have food, and you can't have water, and you've got to pray. And I said, but how do I pray, Luca? What do I say? She said, it's your first fast. So on your first fast, you have to ask Creator and Mother Earth to help you to remember why, you're, why you are alive. And I said, so what do I do then, Guko? And she said, you keep saying it over and over. Creator and Mother Earth, help me to remember why I'm alive. Help me to remember my purpose in this world. And I said, okay, Guko, I'll do it. <laughs> I fasted when I was eight, very first time. 
And my cousin was very smart. She was smart. She took me in the lodge. And um, she looked for two old ladies. She stuck me in between them and she gave each of them tobacco and a gift. And she told them in Cree, watch out for my granddaughter. And she left and she didn't come back till the next day. <laughs> and I was like, she, she's smart. If she would have been sitting beside me, I probably would have cried, said, Gukum, I'm tired. Gukum, I'm hungry. But she was smart. She knew what she was doing. Because I didn't know these old ladies, I wouldn't cry. All I did was follow everything that they did. So if they got up, I got up. If they sat down, I sat down. If they were afraid, I would pray. If they were a little smudge, I would do the same thing. Everything they did. And it didn't take many words. All I did was watch what they were doing and do the same thing. So we have a lot of ways of learning. You can learn something really beautiful and there's no words. So that time, those old ladies, they taught me something really beautiful and there was no words. All I did was watch them. So I was grateful for that time. And I think that's very important. That's something that's missing with our youth. We see a lot of people, you know, sometimes I get really, um, things puzzle me in my mind. So I remember, you know, I worked in a school for a long time, and you know something really, um, really cool is I only have a grade nine Western education. I quit school in grade nine. I have no Western education. My my parents, my mom was very mad at me, and she said, "You need to go to school because she's been a teacher over 40 years, and I want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher." And I said, "Mom." That's for you, it's not for me. And she said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a traditional teacher. And she said, well, what is that? And I said, I don't know, but that's what I want to do. Because I thought about what I love the most in this world. And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. That's a question that we need to get our children to ask them. What do you love in this world? Where do you feel the most love and the, the calmest? And the most love I ever felt and the calmest I ever felt in my spirit was listening to creation stories. It was hearing about natural law. My heart was so calm and I couldn't get enough. I remember I used to get up, my musham would be done telling stories, like, musham, one more, one more. You know, and he'd keep telling me another story, and I'd say, no, we have to go to bed, no sin. And they would never, I would always fall asleep to him telling these stories. And that's how I decided what I needed to do with my life. I decided that by thinking about when was the happiest moments of my life. When did I feel really fulfilled in my life? And it was listening to the creation stories. It was listening to natural law. I felt peace. I felt happy, and I felt whole, and it, and it was so important to me. You know, I had a, such a hard time to go to uh, Munya school. I remember when I went to school, boy, I got in a lot of trouble, because I argued with those teachers all the time. And one of the things, one of the most beautiful gifts that my grandparents gave to me was, they let me interrupt them if they were talking. I was never told, shh, nobody ever said that to me. So I always had my voice. I always was able to speak for myself as a child, as a teenager, as a young woman, and as now I'm a grandmother. I was always able to talk about whatever it was that was in my heart or in my mind because my voice was never taken from me. And it's sad, we live in a time now where people will say, shh, be quiet, don't talk, don't talk. I never got that. I never received that as a child. If my Gugu and Musham were talking and I didn't understand what they were saying, I'd say, Gukam, Gukam. I'd pat her on the leg and she'd say, what Musham? You were saying this, what does it mean Gukam? And she would stop and she would explain it to me. She would tell me what I was asking. So I never lost that voice. And I didn't realize that the how powerful that voice was, how powerful it was, and that I needed that voice. 
and that all of our children need that voice. I didn't realize I, how many children had their voices taken until I went to school. So one time I was in school and uh, they were doing a social studies and we were doing a class on the average lifespan of human beings around the world. And our teacher was a white lady, and this wasn't a reserve school, it was in Sweetgrass. Anyway, so they had all these different countries around the world. And then it said Native Americans of North America. And then she got to us, and this is what that teacher said. She said the average lifespan of the Native Americans before the visitors arrived was 35. She said, your people were so dirty, so filthy, so unsanitary, and all that smoke in those teepees, she said, everybody died before they were 35. <laughs> and I'm not a proper lady, and I never claimed to be proper. I was <coughs> raised like a tomboy. My dad raised me, I broke horses, I raced horses. You know, I used to barrel race and train horses with my dad. He was a truck wagon driver and a saddle broke. So I spent most of my days with him. So this is what I said to the teacher. I got up and I said, you're full of shit. <laughs> she grabbed me real rough and she just grabbed me real rough by the back of my jacket and she dragged me all the way going like this to the principal's office and she pushed me to the principal and she told the principal what I said and the principal said tell your teacher you're sorry I said sure why should I be sorry you guys are lying that book is lying you should be sorry not me and he said no tell her you're sorry I said, nope, I'm not telling her I'm sorry because that book is a lie and you guys are liars. And he said, put your hands up. So I put my hands up. Back then, they used to have a big belt harness, like horse harness, and it had a loop like this and was sewn together, a real long one. He said, put your hands up. And he strapped me over and over on my hands. He whipped me real hard. And I counted. He must have got up to about 10. He said, are you ready? Are you sorry now? Nope, I'm still not sorry. You're liars, I'm not sorry. <laughs> and I wanted to cry, but I wouldn't cry no matter what. 21 times he strapped me on my hands. That principal was just dripping with sweat and he shook his head because I wouldn't say sorry. And he said, sit down. And I sat there, and he made me sit in the office. I didn't get lunch. I sat there right till 3.30 on a chair. I was really mad, <clears throat> and, I was, and like I said, I was a tomboy. So I was kind of smart back then. I thought, boy, I'm real mad if I go on a bus, if a kid says something, I might punch somebody. So that's not a good idea. I better run home. <laughs> so I didn't go on a bus because I was upset, and I always felt better when I would run, or if I'd ride a horse, that anger would leave me or if I was in the bush, that anger would leave me. So I spent a lot of time in the bush. So I ran home really fast. Oh, and I, by the time I got home, that anger had left me. And when I walked in the door, it just so happened my mushroom was there. And I walked in the door and I said, mushroom, right when I opened the door, he was standing right on the steps and I was so happy because he didn't live with us. But for some reason, but boy, the creator is powerful, hey? For some reason, he was standing right there. He came to visit us right at that time. And I said, Mushum. And I didn't tell him what happened to me. Mushum, he said, what? When you were a little boy, how old was the oldest living man that you ever seen? He said, well, on our reserve, there was an old man. He was 134. And I said, really? And he said, yep. He said, you know, a long time ago, the people, they, everything they did was prayer. When they ate, they prayed. When they hunted, they prayed. They put tobacco, fishing, put tobacco, berries, they put tobacco, medicine, they put tobacco. Even drinking water, they were praying. And he said, our life was all about prayer. And he said, it was nothing. It was normal for somebody to live over a hundred. He said, because we were so healthy, because the way we lived and we were close to the earth. And so I was really, it, it gave me a really big relief. And when I tra started to travel around in the different communities, that's a question that I always ask them. 
And it's not a question that I, I'm asking them because I want to know. It's a question because I want them to remember. I want them to remember who we were and who we still are. So I ask them, go and find the oldest people you can find in your community. Go and ask them. How old was the oldest living man and woman that you ever seen when you were a child? Go to these old people and go and ask them, how did you live when you were a child? How did you get water if you didn't live by a creek or a river? How did you keep your food if you had no fridge? How did you do it? These are the things I ask. My grandparents and my dad, they all passed, you know, um, uh, by the time I was 24, all four grandparents were gone and my dad. And I had my whole childhood up until that time in ceremonies. And I spent so much time with my grandparents and my dad and I missed it. And my Gugum told me, she, she called me one time and um, she, my auntie phoned me and said, Gugum wants to see you. She was in an old folks home, and I remember when I, you know, uh, when I was a little girl, I remember she used to tell me, Lucid, don't ever promise something, because if you promise something to the Creator, and you don't fulfill that promise, things are not going to go well. Don't ever do that, she told me. So when she called me to the old folks home, my auntie said, Gukum wants you, you're supposed to go right away. I said, okay, I'll go. So I went to go see her. And she told me, Lucid. I said, what Gukum? And I was a real big baby. When I go to the old folks' home, I'll lay on the bed with her. <coughs> Sometimes I'll camp there with her, and I'll sleep on the bed with her, and I'll hug her, and she'll hug me. And even though I was a grown woman, she still treated me like a baby. She would hug me all the time. And she said, Lucid, I want you to promise me something. And I said, what Gukum? And she said, I can't live forever. And she said, I'm not going to live forever. I don't have long. She said, I want you to promise me something. And I knew this was a big deal because she told me, don't ever make promises. And she said, I want you to promise me that when I leave this world, that you will never stop praying. I promise you, Bukum, I won't stop praying. I want you to promise me that you will never stop going to the ceremonies, even though I'm not here to take you. I promise you, Gukum, I will never stop going. Promise me this, that you will always learn. I promise you, Gukum, I will always learn. She said, because if you don't, who will teach your children? If you don't do this, who is going to show them? And I said, okay, Gukum, I'll listen to you. I will, I'll do it. So after she passed, um, I was so lonesome for her. And there were so many questions that I wanted to ask her still. So I took all those questions to her friends and to my Musham's friends. I went to visit all their friends. Anybody that I knew that was friends with my Bukum and Musham, I went to visit them. So I'd ask them these questions. How did you eat when you were a small child? No fridge, no stove. Did you guys ever go to the doctor? No, we had our own medicine. What does the things like, you know, what does the beadwork mean? My Gugum told me, she said, long time ago, she said, the people used to have a gathering. And she said, what did they put on the girls' clothing, the women's clothing, the beadwork? You would know that person had that medicine, they carried it. She said, they didn't just put flowers on the beadwork, just good stuff. You would know. And she said, when you would go to the trading camps, the certain medicine you would look for, you would look on the women's dresses and you would look for that medicine. Then you would know that that girl, her Gukum or her mom, or maybe even her, that their family carried that medicine. Then you would go where her camp is and you would go and ask them. And then they, you would make a trade with them. She said, that's how we did it. She said, that's why on the beadwork, families have certain flowers. It was because that family carried that medicine. And you see certain different vines on the beadwork. They had that medicine. So she told, she talked to me about uh, the beadwork, about the designs on them. And I was really thankful for these beautiful things that she taught me. 
Um, one of the stories, <clears throat> you know, like lots of these stories that they told me, they've actually taken me maybe 30 years to figure them out. But this one um, story, I remember my Gukum and Musham, they talked to me, but they said it in Cree. And they, well, how I translated the story was, she spoke about my dad and my Gukum, they talked about, they said that there are seven level, levels of our existence. She said, we are alive and there are seven parts of our life. And she said, the first part, she said, of our life, and she said, we were alive even before we entered into our mother's womb. She said, you were alive in the spirit world. And she said, in the spirit world, the creator, he gave you many stories. He taught you all of the solutions for every problem that you were gonna have. And he showed you, he let you pick your parents. And on one side, he said, look this way. And on this hand, it was the most difficult, most heartbreaking, mo most painful things that you were ever gonna witness in your life. And on this side was the most beautiful things that you were ever gonna see while you're alive. And the love, the happiness, the joy, all the most beautiful parts of your life. And she said, then the creator asked you, because he gave you free will. He said, do you still want to go? Now that I've shown you the difficult, and I've also shown you the beautiful, love always outpowers the difficult. So we all agreed, every one of us sitting in this room, that we were going to be born, and that we were going to be alive. And we agreed, even though we saw our own heartbreak, even though we saw our own pain, because that love is so powerful. We agreed. And so then we came. We entered into our mother's womb. The first place, the first element we entered is water. So I was working with these elders back home and they had um, this book. They asked me to help them to teach uh, traditional life skills. And in the cover on one of these books, it said Matsu In. And um, one of the elders said, it means the good life. And I didn't want to say anything at that time. Matsuwin, key word, matu. The correct translation of matsuwin is, this is the life of tears. The key word is tears. And this Western world has really tainted the way we look. Because if you ask somebody, what comes up when you hear the word tears? Matu. Usually people say sadness, but we don't just cry because we are sad. We cry because we are so happy. We cry because something is so funny. We cry because something is so beautiful. You know, I had cancer about um, uh, almost 10 years ago now, and the doctors told me I only had uh, less than a year to live. <coughs> and I, I started to plan my funeral. I had cancer in the throat and in this one lung. And they said I didn't have very long to live. And um, I, I accepted at that time that I was gonna die. And I started traveling around and started asking uh, my family, this is what I want for my children. And then when I went to visit their, my kid's dad and I told him I'm dying, I don't have very long to live, I'm really sick. And I told him this is what I want for the kids. And I drove away from his house. When I drove away, I stopped on the road and I cried. And I thought, you know what? No matter how much my mom loves my children, she will never ever love them like me. No matter how much my kid's dad loves my kids, he will never <coughs> love them like me. And that day, I told the creator, I said, if you let me live, I'll work for you. If you let me live to watch my children grow up and to watch my grandchildren grow up, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do, just let me live. And, uh, and I decided that day that I was gonna live. I decided that day that I'll do whatever it takes to be alive. And, uh, I, took, uh, I went to a lot of ceremonies, I did a lot of praying. Uh, one of the things that um, I tell people is I didn't want to hear that word cancer. 
I didn't want to hear about it. And I told uh, my husband, I told him, I don't want anybody coming to this house and I do not want to hear the word cancer. I don't want to hear about it. The only thing I want to hear about is healing. And, and I said, I don't want somebody to come to my house and feel sorry for me and look at me like I'm already dead. I don't want people crying. I don't want that. And it was hard on him, but I told him, do not answer the door. Even my mom would come to check on me and he would we'd keep all the curtains closed and he would, uh, he would say, your mom is at the door, what do you want me to do? I say, don't answer. I don't want her to feel sorry for me. I don't want pity. I don't need pity. I need to live, I need to be alive. So I said, okay. So he didn't let her in for one month. And we, I never saw anybody, just him. And I stayed home and I smudged how many times a day. I prayed how many times a day. I talked to the creator how many times a day. I was so sick. I, uh, I didn't have enough oxygen in my body. One time I slept uh, two days and my husband got really scared. He was trying to take me to the hospital because he couldn't wake me up. And uh, he started to make me wake up. He would clap his hands and say, wake up, Dad, wake up. Yesterday you stayed up 15 minutes at a time. Now tomorrow you're gonna stay up 20 minutes at a time. And he would push me just to stay awake. I wasn't even washing dishes or doing nothing. Just to stay awake. And it's funny because even though I couldn't wake my body up to get out of bed, my mind was still awake, fully awake, and all I thought about was healing. So that was important to me. So when my first grandson was born, oh my God, I, it was the, the, one of the most beautiful days. I couldn't even believe how I felt. You know, usually when they take babies out from their mom, they'll say, put the baby on the mom's heart right away. And my Nussim was bored and I was standing there. And they pulled him right out from his mom and I cut the cord and the nurse said, lay him on your heart. And I was so frozen and I put him on my heart and I looked at him and I thought, oh my God, I did it, I made it. This is the most beautiful creature I've ever seen in my whole life. And I just cried and it was a strange cry because you know when you cry, you have a lump in your throat? But these tears were just coming right out of my eyes. And they were tears because I was so happy. They were tears because I was so grateful that I made it to that point, that I got to see my grandson. Now I have six grandchildren. And all they came right one after another. <laughs> so I'm happy to be uh, a hookah. And, uh, you know, there was times where I'd go and sit outside. Sometimes my heart would be lonely. There's a real beautiful place where I live. It's called Drumming Hill. There's another one called uh, Saskatchewan Sliding Hill in Sweetgrass. So when my heart feels sad or I feel lonely, I go out to those places in the bush on the land. And I sit on the land. My, one of my favorite times is when the sun is setting. So I drive out. When I, I watch when the sun is going down and my kids know this, this is regular. And uh, they ask me to come with me sometimes and I go drive out there. And I sit there and I just watch the sunset. And I just think, man, this is so beautiful. And all these thoughts come to my mind, you know, like how beautiful the sky is when there's all this pink and this purple and this blue things that are, are very difficult that you can't even paint. Even you try to take a picture, it never comes out. But when you're right there, right at that moment, it's so beautiful. And I've sat there how many times and I've cried just because I thought that was so beautiful. But it took me a long time to learn how to cry. And the second word, matut san, matuk, key word, the place where you go and sit to leave your tears. Sweat is not the proper translation for it. Matuk, matut san, where you go and sit and leave your tears. The other word, pun matso, pun matu. We don't even have a word in Cree for death. There's none. And if you go ask any other tribes, any other languages, if there's a word for death, there's none. 
what it says is one matso, one mato. This one is never going to cry again. That's what it means. Because we don't have a word for death. So my Gugum explained these things to me. And so this is what we are on now. There's, there's actually four key words, but I can't remember the other one. So the first one, Matsuin, so this is the life of tears. Matutsa, the place where you sit to leave your tears. Bun Matsu, this one is never gonna cry again. So this part two, now we're on part two. Uh, this physical life that we're living right here, right now, it's all about tears. So to master this life and to really understand what it means to be alive is to cry. And the sad part is, is that they knew what they were doing in the residential schools. They really knew what they were doing. They beat up kids. Shut up, shut up, don't cry. Shut up, shut up, don't cry. Shut up, I said don't cry. Next thing you know, parents are coming home and they don't know that that's not right. Next thing you know, parents are coming home because that's how they were raised. They're telling their own kids, shut up, shut up, shut up. My parents did that to me too, they didn't know. But I realized this after, when I started to figure out my Gukum story, what she talked about, the life of tears. And that one, my Gukum, she didn't ever say that to me. She never said, don't cry. When I would cry, she wouldn't even say words. She would just sit beside me and she would hold my hand and she would just let me cry. So when I started to figure out this story, it actually took me two years to learn how to cry. I had to give myself permission. So I would tell myself, I would say, Daffy, you're an adult now and no one's gonna tell you, shut up, shut up. No one's gonna say that to you ever again. <coughs> And I would tell myself, I give you permission to cry. I give you permission to be alive. I'm going to give you that permission to live. And slowly, I started to just allow those tears just to flow whenever they needed to come. I just let them come out. And like I said, it took me two years to give myself permission to cry. And my Gugum also said, you know, I didn't figure this part out till later too. She said, uh, so Munya Wak, they have this word, it's called Deja Vu. Deja Vu, the traditional spiritual explanation of Deja Vu is you are remembering what the Creator told you in the spirit world before you were born. That's what Deja Vu is. You're actually remembering what the Creator told you. And during that time when I was sick, you know, I'm just going to be straight to the point. Something happened, I went to the spirit world, and I got sent back. He didn't want me. <laughs> he said, go back. <laughs> but I saw some pretty beautiful things while I was there, and they asked me to come back, and they asked me to bring messages back, and they asked me to translate for them. So I said, okay, uh, I accept the job, I take the position. <laughs> but uh, so I agreed uh, that I would do that. Uh, work for the Creator and, and deliver the messages, whatever it is they asked me to to do. And that, that's really important. That's why I said, whenever I speak, I say, Creator and Mother Earth, bless this water. Water Spirit, I need you. I ask you to help me that my words flow pure and smooth in Creator and Mother Earth's loving way. Creator and Mother Earth's truthful way. Creator and Mother Earth's healing way. Creator and Mother Earth's forgiving way. Creator and Mother Earth's understanding way. And then I drink the water. And an elderly man taught that to me. I was uh, 27 the first time I spoke at a conference. And uh, I was very scared. But he told me that because I was young, he said, people are going to question you. Not because they want to know, but because they don't understand how you know. They don't understand how you could know these things. And he said, so drink the water, and the water will help you speak. The water will help you to answer the questions of the people. So I did that. And uh, uh, it was really helpful. So anytime you need to speak, even with your family, your children, you're having a hard time, use that. Use that gift. 
pray for the water, ask the water spirit to help you so that your words feel pure and smooth. And uh, <clears throat> so now we're going to go back. So part three. Once you leave the physical body, when matzo, once you stop crying and you start traveling to the next world, part three is my dad said, when they leave the body, they travel around in the Mother Earth and they learn all the secrets of Mother Earth and they travel to all the most beautiful places on the Earth, the sacred sites. They learn all the secrets of Mother Earth and there's... Uh, it's, it's, this is actually a really super long story. I'm going to try and tell as much as I can. But he talked about there was even a place inside of Mother Earth. And there was some, you know, there's, it's, it's a super long story, but there's some of our relatives in creation that didn't want to be a part of what we're living in today because they have their own prophets. So a lot of these animals that they say are extinct, they're not extinct. They just said, we don't want anything to do with what is happening to this world, so we're going to go live inside the Mother Earth. And when the cleansing comes, we're going to come out and we're going to help the people. So that was one of the things that um, uh, is a very, that was a very long story, but I'm just going to move on. Um, <clears throat> so he said, that's part three. They learned the secrets of Mother Earth. Part four, they then travel to the Long Lodges which is the stars. They said the, when the creator, he made the first laws, he, when he was finished teaching these first lawmakers, he asked each of them to carry a certain law. So I don't know very much. I'm just at the beginning of remembering them and, and the beginning of learning about them. So I'm learning about the constellations in the stars. And the grandfathers have taken me and taught me some of these things that are that are happening. They told me about like the constellation of the bear. The grandmother bear and the grandfather bear, they they are the ones who hold the laws of child rearing. We have laws of how you're supposed to raise your children. There's laws in there. And it's very important. I'll give you an example. I had one of my sons, he's always in jail, he's living on the streets and, uh, you know, uh, doing drugs, selling drugs, violence, and um, I tried to help him. He wasn't raised like that, he was raised in a ceremony family, but he left, he went, so he went to live on the streets and got into lots of trouble. Anyways, um, he phoned me one time and he said, uh, He's, he's, I've gotten some pretty scary calls from him. He called me and said, Mom, I'm getting shot at right now. In case if I die, I just wanted to phone you. And I could hear gunshots in the back. And I'd say, pray with me. Don't get scared. Pray with me. And so we would pray. And he'd call me again. Mom, he said, I never ate three days. He said, uh, and I have nowhere to sleep. I got nowhere. I'm just walking around. He said, I'm stuck. Where are you stuck by? Sick, sick up. And I said, okay. He said, can you send me money so I could eat? And I said, okay, listen here, son. I, there's natural laws that I have to follow, that you're my child, and I cannot overstep the creator. So I'm going to tell you a story. Every year I go fast, and I have no food and no water for four days, and I never die. And I said, have you been drinking water? And he said, yes. I said, all right, I'm going to tell you another fact, son. If you're drinking regular tap water, a human being can live 10 days on just water alone. So you ain't going to die. That's the good news. <laughs> and I said, and no, I will not send you money. I said, I will pray for you. And if you pray hard enough and you tell the creator, creator, I'm hungry, you talk to him. You talk to the creator, not me. Because I'm not going to step over him. And I'm not going to cross that line of, you know, uh, of a creator trying to teach you something. I'm not going to interfere in your lesson. I said, so if you're hungry enough, you will pray. I said, all right, son. I'm at work right now. And you know what the strange thing was? Is I was working in a treatment center in Nelson House. That day he called me and it was lunch break. So I was in a room full of addicts. And we're just like my son. And I had to tell my son this. 
And I said, all right, I love you. I send you a prayer. That's all I can give you today. So have a good day. Maybe you can call me tomorrow, but I love you. And I hung up the phone and I went back to work. And the next day, he called me. He said, Mom, he said, I was walking down the road. And he said, I was real hungry. My stomach was just growling. So I started to pray, and I told the Creator what you told me. I said, Creator, I'm hungry. I never ate three days, and I'm really hungry. I have nowhere to sleep. I have nowhere to be, nowhere to live. And he said, uh, <clears throat> all of a sudden, he said, there was a real old truck starts coming down the road. Boy, a real old truck. It was just, you know, real old Ford, real old style truck from a long time. All of a sudden, this, this old truck, it stopped. And this old man, he rolled down the window. And he said, hey, cowboy. And he said, where are you going? And my son said, I don't know where I'm going. He said, what's your name? He said, Nakoda Puyak. And he said, are you related to David Puyak? And he said, yes, that's my grandpa. He raised me. He said, oh, your grandpa was my good friend. We used to ride saddle drum together. Get him. And he got in a truck. And he said, I got to this old man's house in Siksika. He took me to his house, little small house. And he said, when I got in, he said, all right, cowboy. He said, he went in our room. He said, he had a real old-fashioned Wranglers, an old-fashioned snap-button Western shirt, eh? He said, you know what, Mom? That old man even gave me one of his clean gitch hats. <laughs> he said, that was really weird. <laughs> and he gave me clean socks, black socks, too. <laughs> And he said, he said, cowboy, get in the shower. It looks like you never had a shower for days, and it smells like it too. <laughs> so he jumped in the shower. He said, oh, and I put on that old man's clothes, even his gitch, that was strange, bum. He said, I came out of the shower. Boy, there was toast, fried eggs, coffee, water. He said, so I sat there, and I ate. And he said, um, and this old man, he smudged me. And he prayed for me. And he talked to me about Papa. He told me about Papa and the, the times that they used to have together. They were friends. See, my dad raised my oldest son in our, in our culture. The firstborn grandchild, the grandparents raised where I come from. So he was raised from a Roman dad. And he was very heartbroken when my dad died. He really lost his way and he threw himself away. He felt like he didn't belong anymore because my dad wasn't alive but he still belongs. Uh, <clears throat> so that made him really happy. And I said, good, good. I said, you see, son? I said, if I would have stepped over the creator, and if I would have sent you money that day, you wouldn't have never met that old man. You would have never heard his words, and you would have not felt his prayers. I said, this is why I do what I do. This is why I do not step over, and I do not what they call basta hof. Basta hof means to step over the creator and to think that you know more than the creator. And I always tell him, whatever you want in your life, I said, you can have it because one of our first gifts is free will. And I said, one day, son, you will stop hurting yourself. One day, you will stop letting that pain destroy you. I said, but that's not up to me. It's up to you. And you know, sometimes my kids would say, you know, I, I heard my son say this to me too before. He said, I hate you, mom. I heard my kids say that too. I hate you, mom. And I remember my heart used to hurt when my kids would say that. And I got, I remember the natural law. I remember the stories. And I told my, uh, my kids, I said, all right, we have natural law, and I gotta follow that. So I wanna tell you something today. I don't even need you to like me to be your mom. You don't have to like me. I want you to get something straight today, because I'm not gonna repeat myself. I am not your friend, I am your mother. And you don't even need to like me. It's okay if you hate me, it's okay if you get mad. I'm all right with that. But you need to know that you don't even have to like me and I'm still your mom. You don't have to care about me and I'm still your mom. And I said, but I've learned enough. 
about natural law that I understand what my duty is as a mother. And my duty, in nowhere in those duties does it say be a friend. It doesn't say that. It says be a mom. And <clears throat> from that time, you know, uh, um, uh, my children stopped saying that to me. They stopped saying they hate me. So that's important. So there's many of these, I wish we had more time because there's many different constellations and each of them has um, uh, a spirit that resides in these constellations in the stars and they hold natural law and they teach natural law and it's very important. Uh, I'll just talk briefly about the one, <coughs> um, the one uh, that holds the natural law of governance is the buffalo. The, the buffalo holds our governance. So really, when we have problems with our children, we should be calling upon the grandmother and the grandfather bear for guidance to help us, because they are the ones that hold the laws of childbirth. When we have problems with our tribal governance, our natural governance, we need to call upon the buffalo, because those are the ones that hold the laws of governance, our tribal governance. governance. And then we have the wolf, and the wolf holds the laws of protection. You have every right to defend and protect your children, your family, your home, your community. But within that protection, if you become in a rage, you are just as guilty as the one who was trying to hurt you. So these laws, they teach us how to live. They teach us um, how to stand. They teach us the proper way. So um, that's that part about um, uh, part, let's see. that's part four. So the first one was when we're in the spirit world, we're alive. Second one was the life of tears. The third one, travel around Mother Earth and learn the secrets of Mother Earth. The fourth one is they travel to all the law lodges in the stars and the constellation. Then the fifth one, my Gukum and my dad said, once you get to that fifth one, and all of these things that you've learned on the first four, you then get paired up and you get sent back over here. And you will get paired up with somebody who was like you when you were alive. So then you become a guardian angel, grandmother, grandfather, whatever it is. So every single one of us here is going to come back. And the creator is going to give us a job. It's going to say, all right, I'm going to send you back. And one of your duties is you're going to go help this one over here. You're going to help them. And they're a lot like you when you were alive. So you're going to go back and you're going to help them. And when you help them to a certain point, then you will go on to the next part. So that's number five. You get sent back and you become a grandmother or grandfather or how Munya say guardian angels. So number six is, my dad said, you then get to sit next to the Creator. And then the Creator teaches you about the whole universe. He teaches you about uh, how everything works in the whole universe. So the first one, you learn about uh, you're with the Creator. You're only brought here with love. Part two, you learn about this life, Mother Earth, the tears. Uh, part three, you learn about secrets of Mother Earth and you go out one more. And then you learn about the secrets of the stars, the, the laws. Then you go out one more and you learn about the universe. So they're all in circles. They're all going like this, 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 this. And if you take a look at that, from part two, before you get to the creator, there's four levels in there. So my Gugum said, this is why we, before, so part six, you sit beside the creator, teaches about the universe. And from learning all of these things from one to six, by sitting next to the Creator, you become so pure. And you become 100% pure love. And then that one is part seven. You return and you sit back in the Creator's heart and you wait to be born again. So in between here and when we return to the Creator's hearts, there's four in there. So this is why we have four feasts. The first feast after somebody passes away onto the next world, the first one is you have your first feast feast, and that is to feed your relative, to navigate them through their travels to the secrets of Mother Earth. The second feast is to help your relatives to navigate, give them enough food, enough sustenance to travel. 
The second feast is to help them when they travel to the stars, to the law lodges. You're feeding them so that they have enough strength to get to all the law lodges. The third one, you're feeding them again for their journey when they're going to come back and they're going to be a grandmother or grandfather or guardian angel. And the fourth one is you're giving them enough food till they sit next to the creator and learn the secrets of the world, of the whole universe. So, um, this story is actually a lot longer, but you know I had to kind of make it shorter. It's a, it's a it's a little bit longer than that, but it's important. One of the things that really pushed me to learn about the language and about our, our traditional ceremony words is I wanted to learn. I was getting ceremony songs given to me, and in these ceremony songs, um, uh, I didn't know what I was singing. <laughs> And I thought, man, am I ever a disrespectful kid? No respect that. <laughs> and I was like, how could I do this? You know, my gukum would never have it. Me singing a song, her song. And I don't even know what I'm singing. So I started to take those songs apart, each of the words, the meaning. And when I started to take the Cree language apart and looking for the key word, what it really means, I realized that there's no way that you could put this, I looked at a Cree dictionary, and there's no way that you could put our words into one English word you can't, because it is a whole phrase, it's a whole idea. It's almost impossible. When you're, when you're speaking Cree, to try to translate into English, it's a really long story. It's not short. It's full of virtues, it's full of ideas. So that's important. <clears throat> and um, one of my um, favorite songs, it, it's a really beautiful story. And it talks about, it speaks about this man. And this man was having a really hard time in life. And they talked about that he wasn't right in his mind in this song. And it says he wasn't right in his mind, he lost his mind. And the creator, he was praying, and the creator took him into the stars, to the law lodges, and he went to visit there. And as he learned not natural law, the more he learned about natural law, he was not crazy anymore, and his mind was straight. So it's a really beautiful song, but it took me a long time to take it apart. What does it really mean? What does this song mean? So that's important. So I'm going to sing a little bit of that song, and I'm not going to use this.